Good evening, everyone. I think we'll start. My name is Terry Murphy, and I am the Deputy Chief of Staff for Communications for the Mayor. Thanks for coming tonight on a super hot night. Um, what we're going to do tonight is the Mayor has PowerPoint, obviously, and she's going to provide a presentation, and then we'll take comments and questions. Um, Troy Anderson on our staff over here is going to be the manager of the microphone. Um, so if you want to speak, just let Troy know and he will come to you. We are going to ask that if you have a comment or a question, that you limit it to one so that everyone has an opportunity to participate. Good enough? All right, again, thank you for coming. It is awfully warm out there tonight. It, it kind of feels like an oven. I did want to explain that with these, these town hall meetings that we're just focusing on our roads, the surfaces of our roads, and we're gonna give you a lot of information tonight and open it up for questions. But the timing of it, I wanted to explain, when I do my seven town hall meetings every fall, and I'm gonna do those seven town hall meetings again this fall, but we always have them at the same time in the evening, and we've gotten a lot of requests to have some in the day for those who work in the evening or have kids in the evening, some in the late afternoon, so that's why we kind of varied the times and hoped that at least everybody could find one time that worked for us. So that's why we kind of have this odd time in here tonight. So thank you for coming. Um, with, I have a few staff members that are here tonight, and I do want to introduce them to you so you know who they are. Did I see Bob Stubbe? Oh, where? There. He's out in the hallway. Okay. Well, our public works director, Bob Stubbe, is here, and he's out in the hallway. But you will see him soon. Todd Fitzer is right here. He is the city engineer. Um, Austin Rouser, raise your hand. Austin right there is the street maintenance engineer. Um, Dave Fanslaw is over here. He is our planning director. Steve Curtis is next to him. Finance director. Um, Steve Jensen, next to him. Former planning director. Um, I have my chief of staff, Marty, is in the back. Marty Bielek, there's Bob Stubbe in the back. Um, Troy Anderson is Deputy Chief of Staff in my often, often in my office. Kevin Anderson, Deputy Chief of Staff. You just met Carrie, she's a Deputy Chief of Staff. And Jasmine is here tonight. Jasmine, raise your hand. If you guys call the hotline a lot, that is one of those nice, pleasant voices that you hear all the time answering the hotline. Jasmine and Brandy next to her. Uh, she's on my staff, does a lot of community work, but Brandy works on the hotline at times, too. So anyway, if I can't answer your question tonight, I'm hoping some of these people that are here can. So what I want to do with these town hall meetings is I feel like it gives me the opportunity to explain to all of you the scope of the road fixes that we need and to receive public feedback. The problem that we are having with our roads right now did not just happen this year. It did not just happen the last six years. This has been decades in the making, and I'm going to explain that to you. And what we really need and what we want to focus on is we really need a long-range, adequately funded plan that boosts the city's ability to make more permanent changes with our roads. We have never had a long-range plan of pavement maintenance in the city of Omaha. And as I said, I'll get into that, but that is what we need to prevent from happening again and again what happened this spring after the results of a very severe winter. Our streets practically exploded all over the city, all over the Midwest. And our streets are old. We recognize they're old. They have been underfunded for many years. But what we need now is to talk about a plan to prevent things like that from happening again in the future. So we're gonna identify what the problem is. We're gonna talk about what we have done about it. And I'm gonna talk about since I've been mayor, we're gonna talk about what is needed to improve maintenance and repair. We're gonna talk about what we need as far as revenue and what options are out there. And then we're gonna talk about the next steps. But your input is important in determining what those next steps will be. I want to make sure I let you know in the beginning, we have not developed a plan yet. We want to present the information to you and get your feedback and use your feedback to develop a plan. One thing I want to let you know though, this tonight is not about an individual pothole in front of your house or the street in front of your house or an individual issue. This tonight is about the broad scope of what we need in our roads throughout the city of Omaha. If you have an individual pothole or an individual problem with a road you want to discuss, 
We're happy to discuss it with you later after the presentation. We have plenty of staff members here tonight that can take your address or take where the issue is, and then we could deal with that later. But tonight is not about individual areas of Omaha. This is a broad discussion tonight over what is going on in the streets of Omaha. So first of all, I wanted to mention that our work in Omaha is based on my four goals. Um, my goals, and they always have been the same, they're number one, public safety. Number two is uh, managing the city budget. Three is jobs and economic development. And four is improving the taxpayer experience. And I just want to kind of go through those just very briefly because we've had great successes in most of them. Number one, public safety, that's my number one responsibility, is keeping the citizens of Omaha safe. And we have had a lot of improvements over the last six years. Um, one of the things that we have done, this slide shows, is we have added 100 new police officers. Um, we are building a fifth precinct out in West Omaha. We've expanded our gang unit. We've made a lot of improvements as far as public safety goes in the city of Omaha but you want to see results. And this sl slide shows we have seen great results as far as public safety goes. I can tell you we've hired 100 new officers, but it won't mean anything until you see these results. What this shows up here is we use seven indexes to evaluate crime, and every one of those indexes showed improvement in 2018. In fact, our homicide rate alone went down 20, 27%. To put that in perspective, last year we had 22 homicides the entire year. In 2015, we had 50. I mean, that's less than cutting that less than half. So we have a, a really high clearance rate, meaning the homicides that are, are occurring are being solved. We have low complaints against our officers. So as far as public safety goes, we have seen some really great results, and we're happy with those results. Um, second slide shows managing the city budget. And City of Omaha is very fiscally sound right now. Um, I became mayor in 2013. Our budget was in quite a, a lot of trouble. Um, it was estimated, something's wrong with that slide there. It was estimated that the 2013 budget was going to be about $13 million short by the end of the year. 2014 budget was supposed to be $20 million short. So we had a lot of work to do. And, and we have made the budget very, very fiscally sound. What I wanted to do is really control spending. Our goal was to keep spending the year over year growth at about 3% or less. And we've basically achieved that. Um, every year since I've been mayor, we've turned those deficits into surpluses by the end of the year. And that's by very, very careful budget managing. Um, and people ask me a lot of times when I say we have those surpluses, they always will say, well, what are you going to do with all that extra money? And we are governed by the city charter. The city charter is like our constitution. And the city charter says that if I have a surplus in 18, which I did, you can't use it in 19. You can only use it in 20. And so with that surplus in 18, while I was developing the 2020 budget, which takes about 10 months to develop because it's all based on estimates of sales tax, property tax, occupation taxes, and that surplus. We use every penny of that surplus to fund the 2020 budget that we had in 18. So it's not extra money. Every bit of it is used. But the reason we've been able to add more, more police officers and firefighters and add more street, uh, to street repair and maintenance is because we have managed through the year with the budget that we had and actually managed with less money than was budgeted. So we're trying to be very, very carefully careful with managing the city budget. And we have reduced the property tax levy twice. So we have accomplished these things we've accomplished with a lower tax levy. Um, job growth and economic development, we've had really good progress with this too. Our unemployment rate in Omaha is 2.9%. Um, in the United States it's 3.6, so we're better than the, the average unemployment rate in the entire country. Um, some numbers that I use to, to, um, to talk about the growth we have had in Omaha are the number of building permits that are being issued. And since 2013 in Omaha, we have issued 283,000 building permits. That's a value of $4.9 billion. So if you talk about growth and things happening in Omaha, you could see by the building permits and no, uh, alone that there's been a lot of investment and a lot of growth and a lot of things happening. And that happens 
from all the way from the Missouri River all the way out to the Elkhorn River. Lots of developments and things are happening. Now my fourth priority is improving the taxpayer experience. I want people that deal with the city of Omaha to feel like they're getting really good service for their tax dollars. A couple of the things I'm very proud of that we've done very well with, we've redesigned all of our websites. Um, we have new websites like we have cityofomaha.org, we have keepomahamoving.org, we have wasteline.org. Those are all things that you can use to give you current information. We've really expanded our use of social media, so we use Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to give you current accurate information. Um, we've added some options for my hotline. We always tell people to call 444-5555 for anything, but now we have omahahotline.com that if you don't want to call things in, you can email them in. Right now, our um, IT department is working on a new mobile app, and we're trying to model it after some other mobile apps we have seen in other cities that have been really successful, and basically a one-stop shop that you can do anything from reporting a pothole to know where you vote on, on election day. So we're really working on developing that to make it more convenient to you, too. Um, we post the city budget. Um, the city capital improvement plan and the city's checkbook online now so you can get online anytime and you can follow every penny through the budget or the capital improvement plan or look at our checkbook um, we have a parking app now it's called park omaha it, that's the app and i'll give you another example in our planning department almost all of our plan review our permits and inspections are all done online now to make it much more convenient one thing that I consider part of the customer experience that I feel like we aren't where we need to be is the condition of our roads. We definitely need better roads. We have prioritized resurfacing um, and we have increased spending on our roads. Um, an example I always give when I was on the city council in 2010 for road resurfacing that year, we had about two and a half million dollars in the budget. Um, in 2018, we spent about 18 million resurfacing roads. So we've tried to increase the amount that we have for resurfacing every year. But you will see as I go on and give you some data tonight that we're, we're not catching up the way we should be. Um, since I have been mayor, to 2013 to present, we have resurfaced 738 lane miles of road. Well, that's the distance between Omaha and Waco, Texas. So we have resurfaced a lot of road. But keep in mind, we have 5,000 lane miles of road. So we have been working very carefully for the last six years with our planning, to, our, our public works department, our finance department, at making roads a priority and spending more and more money on our roads. However, now we decided to take a really deep dive. And we started working with quite a few outside experts to really help us understand where we are with our roads, what we need to be spending, what we are spending, and a plan for the future. And that's what I'm here to discuss with you tonight. So the goal tonight is to create an action plan for sustainable road maintenance and re rehabilitation. And in a nutshell, and again, I will go into this with a little more detail, but here's where we are. And we have 5,000 lane miles of road in Omaha, keep in mind. We currently spend total about $41 million annually on road repair. Um, that includes things like not only resurfacing, but it includes uh, street rehab, it includes the, the brick streets, it includes street improvement districts. There's a lot of things that go into there. But we spend about $41 million a year. The experts say, based on the value of the surface of our roads, and that value is about $1.5 billion. That's not to rebuild, rebuild them, but that's to resurface them. About $1.5 billion we should be spending 5% of that total amount value of our assets every year. That comes to 75 million. That's what we should be spending. 75 million, we're spending 41. So there is a 34 million gap, dollar gap every year. And this is one of the main reasons why our roads continue to get older every year and continue to crumble because they have been underfunded for years. For decades, they have been underfunded. Um, so we have that shortfall. That shortfall is about $34 million a year. We sh are resurfacing right now about 125 lane miles a year. We should be resurfacing 250 lane miles a year. If we resurface 250 lane miles a year, that would mean in a 20-year period, which is the average lifespan of a road, 
every road in Omaha would be resurfaced once. So what you would have then is a long range sustainable program. Your roads would be resurfaced and then before they started to deteriorate and crumble, they would be resurfaced again. That's your long term sustainable plan. Well, we have never done that. And that's why we are on the conditions that we have now that some of our roads have deteriorated so much you can't even fill a pothole. They're down to dirt. So that's the problem we're going to talk about. So our objectives tonight is to talk about the problem, which is road maintenance, repair, and rehabilitation, what we've done about it in the last six years, what is needed, and revenue needs and options, and then what our next steps are. So the problem, again, the roads are aging. We are 50 years behind where we should be in maintenance and rehabilitation. So this has been decades and decades and decades in the making. It didn't just happen over the last winter, over the last six years, it's been going on for decades, and we have been underfunded for decades. Potholes are a symptom of the problem. They are not the issue. And the potholes are a result of aging infrastructure. And Omaha is not alone in this. This is a nationwide pro uh, problem. And I will guarantee you that every Midwestern city this last winter had the same problems we did. With a very hard winter, you know, usually we are filling a lot of potholes in February. If we filled any potholes, it was only a handful in February because we had multiple snows, multiple snow. We had one blizzard that took us about a week to clean it up. So we didn't even really start filling potholes to about April 18th this year. So that's what happened this year. But, but um, the, the issue is, is we need to meet the fundamental needs of the citizens and the businesses. We have to provide a way for you to get from point A to point B. And that's what we're talking about tonight. And we have more needs than we have money. And I'm going to explain where the money comes from and how it's spent. But at the current rate, of the revenue that we have coming in and that we use on roads, we, we have, don't have enough funding and we're never going to catch up. We're kind of chasing our tail. And even though we've prioritized it since I've been mayor, we can't catch up with the current rate of funding. So that's what I really want to talk to you about. We need to do more. And another thing that's important to talk about is funds that we can spend on road maintenance are restricted. Um, transportation bonds, they cannot be, that street bonds, they can't be used on road maintenance because those transportation bonds have to have a, a, a lifespan of used on things that last 15 years or more. So they can't be used on pothole repair. Another question I get asked a lot is why are you spending $50 million on that, on those parks downtown when you could use that money on pothole repair? Well, the, the answer is you can't use the money we're using downtown on pothole repair. On the 90 acres of parkland, that city-owned property that we are redeveloping, city is putting in $50 million of lease purchase bonds. In return, we get $250 million of private money. I think any investor would think you put 50 in, get 250 back. It's a pretty good investment. But those bonds are called lease purchase bonds. They cannot be used on street repair and maintenance. They can only be used, they're really restricted by what they can be used, and it's basically acquisition of long-term assets. That's not a pothole. So the money that we are using downtown cannot be used on street maintenance. So that's important to remember. Um, some definitions and examples what we're talking about when I talk about street maintenance and rehabilitation, those are things like pothole repair and crack sealing. Rehabilitation is things like doing concrete panel replacements or to mill and, and overlay the roads themselves. So there's, there's a difference in what we're talking about. Some examples of what we're talking about as far as reconstruction and capital improvement, I'll give you some examples if you drive around Omaha and have seen these areas. Um, some of the things we do is number one, to increase street network capacity. And that's something like, those are things like adding lanes and increasing strength of the road. Examples of that is 156th Street, that work we've done from Pepperwood to Corby. Um, 168th Street, that is from Dodge to Maple, and 42nd Street and Q Street intersection. Those are examples of increasing the street network capacity. To replace or rehabilitate pavement is also something we do, especially when it's reached the end of its useful life. Examples of that is the work we're doing at Crown Point, 72nd to Blair High Road, and 11th and Jones Street repair, that's the Brick Street downtown. Um, to enhance safety and functionality of the streets, is another thing that we do a lot on. Examples of that uh, right now, probably the best example I could get is 132nd Center.
that big, huge project that's going on in that intersection there, and it goes north, south, east, west, that is a safety project. That intersection there, there was a lot of accidents in that intersection, um, a lot of left turns allowed over medians. Uh, if you know that area south of center, you can go straight from, from one shopping center all the way across the road to another. That caused a lot of accidents. But to give you an example, 90% of that project is being paid with federal dollars, only 10% local because it's a safety issue. Um, another thing, an area that we work on too is to facilitate redevelopment and economic vitality by expanding our road network. We work with developers all the time to help them make their developments become reality um, and, and, what, and what is also at the same time affordable to us. And a couple of examples of that are when we build new streets. Um, there's a couple developments now. Um, ConAgra is redoing their campus and we are, there's a Harney Street from 8th to 10th. We are rebuilding and Indiana Street is a new street that we're adding in in the Millworks development, which is the one just north of the ballpark. So that's just an example of the different types of construction and capital improvements that we do. But we have to maintain a balance. Um, like I said before, there's two different areas that we're looking at. One is our maintenance budget and one is our construction and capital budget. In our capital improvement plan, that's where those street bonds are spent. Um, it's a six-year plan. Every year we add another year at the end of it. But in 2019 alone, in our capital improvement plan, there's 66 million of street bonds in there, in this year alone. But on the maintenance side, like I said, we're spending 41 million, and that's all our pothole and crack ceiling, and we should be spending the 75. So we need to balance this better because it, 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 the, the maintenance is so important because if we continue just filling potholes, these things are going to happen over and over and over again. So we really need to look at more of a long-range plan that will avoid these things from happening again. So like I said, in the capital improvement plan, that's a six-year plan, um, we do it and develop it along with our, our budget. It goes to the city council the same time the budget does, and it's approved by the city council. It is online. Anybody can look at the capital improvement plan and see the whole thing in there. There's five types of bonds in the capital improvement plan. You, the voters, approve it. Um, about every four years, we go out for a bond issue, and they are transportation bonds, those are street bonds, public safety bonds, park bonds, public facility bonds, and environmental or what we call sewer bonds. And there's also federal dollars in the capital improvement plan. So that's how we do our major road projects with those, those, those bonds and with our federal funds. But it's important to know in that capital improvement plan, it's six years, but only the year we're in is the one that is fully funded. It is what it is, it's a plan. We have to have a plan and we're required to have a plan by our city charter of how we are gonna spend and pay for those bond dollars in those projects. But the only one that is for sure is the year that we are in. Current revenue sources that we use on roads. We get federal dollars, and this is more for our maintenance. We get federal dollars, and this is gas tax dollars, from the state. We get um, street and highway funds, which is our state gas tax. You pay tax when you fill up your car at the pump, and the state gets that money, and we get a portion of that money. But it's a very complicated um, uh, way that we get the money from the state because people ask me a lot, well, why don't you just change what the state does? Well, I'm going to show you in a minute how complicated it is. And then we also locally have the wheel tax. And then we have our capital improvement plan, which I just explained. That's where the revenues come to work on our roads. And that's where we're, they all come from. Now, this slide just shows you the, the formula for the state gas tax for the street and highway funds. So you will see it is extremely complicated about how they determine the amount of money from the gas tax that the city of Omaha gets. Don't ask me to explain it. It's very difficult. But the point I'm trying to make is, I will tell you this, that, that a lot of the money from the state gas tax revenue comes from the city of Omaha, but we only get a portion of it. It goes to the, fund the entire state. And all where it goes, it's very complicated. And this is from the state of Nebraska, so I wanted to show you that. Now, people ask me a lot, I pay my property taxes, what do you do with all my money? You should have enough money to, to resurface every one of those roads. What do you do with my money? I get that question asked me all the time. And here's where your property tax goes. 
your property tax for every dollar here, 62%, 61.5% goes to the school districts. That's where your property taxes go, the majority. The city of Omaha gets 21%. Douglas County gets 12 and a half, and then the other taxing authorities, the NRD, Metro Transit, city county building, they make up the extra four and a half percent. The majority of your property taxes goes to the school. We get about 22%. With the 22% that we get of what you pay in property taxes, that pays for the fire department, the police department, the libraries, the parks, it pays for the planning department, it pays for the public works department, including your trash contract that you have, it includes the law department, the HR department, so 22% of your property tax goes to pay everything that the city funds in their budget, in their general fund budget. Here's an example too, um, if you have a $100,000 home, this is just an example, of where every your, your property taxes go and your annual tax would be on a hundred thousand dollar home about two point two thousand dollars and so if you had a hundred thousand dollars home um, one thousand three hundred dollars goes to the school um, the city of omaha would get four hundred and seventy nine dollars so you can see it i think people assume a lot that all that money goes to the city and, and it, it does not and i think that that's a really good slide to break it down where exactly your property tax dollars do go. I do want to mention with the next slide, we control the city of Omaha tax levy. We do not control what Douglas County does or what the school districts do. This is just the city of Omaha's levy, which is the 22% of your tax bill. 2002 to 2009, it stayed steady. That was during the Fahey administration. Um, 2010 and 11, you had some pretty significant uh, levy hikes a 9.5% and, and a 4.9%. That was during subtle administration. And during my administration, we have lowered the levy twice 2%. So that just kind of shows you the, the history of the levy. What we have done um, to fix the streets, again, in, in 2010, that's when I was on the council, we had 2.8, it says here. I, I told you earlier, 2.5 but we have incrementally raised what we spend on street resurfacing every year. And when I said 18 million a few years ago, um, we, um, with just looking at some accounting and re-looking re at our budget, we found that we had about $5 million in the public works budget that really was, um, basically it was accounted for twice. So we had some extra dollars and we put it all in roads. That's where that 18 million came from. So what have we done to fix the street? That Band-Aid tells it all. Um, right now, because the streets are aging and we're limited in the funds we have to repave and reconstruct roads, we have been doing a lot of pothole repair. Um, people tell me all the time that's a Band-Aid solution, and it absolutely is a Band-Aid solution. It doesn't last. Um, sometimes we'll do pothole repair, and within a month it pops out again, depending on the weather. But we really have no other choice with the revenue that we have and to do something immediate. You have your streets full of holes, we have to repair them as quick as we can so you don't damage your car. Um, if somebody gave me a billion dollars cash today, we could not get everything resurfaced within a year. We couldn't get it probably in 10 years. So it has to be a long-term plan. So in the immediate period of time, we patch hot potholes until we have the funding to get out there and resurface the roads. But just to give you an example, this winter, we spent 13 and a quarter million dollars just on pothole repair. Just on pothole repair. That's enough to resurface 130 lane miles of asphalt. So just think of the streets we could have done if we weren't out there patching potholes. We, that's an estimate right, estimate right here because we just kind of figure out an average amount of asphalt we use per pothole and it's just an average. That, that we have used 9,437 tons of asphalt this year. And that would be the equivalent of repairing about 67,000 potholes. And this is temporary. And what's gonna happen next year if we have the same kind of winter? We're gonna do this all over again. So you can see when I say we're chasing our tails, we're spending so much money on temporary repair when we should be spending it on something more permanent, but we have to do something in the immediate time or people are gonna just ruin their cars, which they have been doing. So we need that long-term sustainable maintenance and rehabilitation that will reduce the annual cost. 
Snow and ice removal is another thing. This year alone, we have to date, we spent seven and a half million on snow and ice. So it shows you what a rough winter we've had so far. For our entire budget for the year, it's 8.2 million is what we budget. And we have to get to December 31st. So we've used up the majority of our snow and ice removal budget already. It just shows you what a hard winter we had. So our challenge, again, we have 5,000 lane miles of road in Omaha. A pro this includes approximately 350 lane miles of unimproved streets. Those are all included. Again, the recommended standard is we should be spending about $75 million a year on street maintenance and rehab, and that's 5% of that total infrastructure, and we're spending about 41. So the challenge is we need $34 million in additional maintenance and rehabilitation dollars to achieve our recommended standard. And I want to repeat it because it's important. We should be resurfacing about 250 lane miles a year. We have the funds to do about 125. And if we did the 250 lane miles annually, then it will ensure that every lane mile in Omaha is resurfaced over the course of its 20 year average lifespan. Now again, that's average because there are some asphalt streets that'll last 50 years, depending on the drainage and the traffic. There's some concrete streets that could last 100 years, but this is just an example and an average. Um, and and the, the one thing else I want to I want to talk about before I talk about additional funding and unimproved streets is a lot of these jobs that we need to do and we could do if we had extra funding are smaller jobs like concrete panel replacement. And if we did have the additional funding to do that, that opens up a lot of opportunities for smaller companies to get more work because these are a lot smaller jobs, the panel replacement, than reconstructing an entire road. So I think that's important to bring up too. The unimproved streets, you've heard about them, the 350 lane miles of it. A lot of these streets were built decades ago. Um, we can't rewrite history, I wish we could, but we can't. Um, these are asphalt streets that have deteriorated. A lot of them have deteriorated to the point that we just can't repair a pothole anymore. They're down to dirt. There's about 300 lane miles of those roads. Um, if we were to update those 300 lane miles of road that are unimproved, today's current standards, it would cost you, the taxpayers, about $325 million. So you can see there's a big cost in doing that. Um, just a couple years ago, or just uh, about a year ago, we did create a new policy within the city of Omaha, one we've never had before, and it was a cost-sharing policy. And what it has always been in the city of Omaha, and it still is in the county, if you lived on one of those unimproved streets, and you wanted it improved to today's standards, concrete street, um, curbs, storm drain, sewers, sidewalks, then you, we would come out, we would engineer it, we would give you an estimate, um, we could hire the company to do it, but you paid for it. And it came out over your, it, it came out in your taxes and you paid for it over about 10 years. That's how it's always been. What we changed and the council changed um, and we had a committee meet and we made, gave them recommendations is that we would start a cost sharing. And that is if you wanted your street concrete, the city would now pay half. If you wanted to stay with asphalt, we would pay a quarter. And we felt like that was at least offering us to do something that we've never done before to help people afford to improve those streets. We also got a change in the legislature instead of a 10 year payback, 20 year payback. However, that still puts the burden, at least 50%, on some of the taxpayers. So there, they, that, it's difficult because there's a, and it's difficult for me to explain because there's a lot of people that will say, and I can't disagree with them, these are city streets, they have deteriorated, why do we even have to pay half? And that's very hard to explain that. There's some areas, um, you know, uh, like I'd say in the Elkhorn area too, um, that are saying when we were, when we were annexed when, during the Fahey administration, why have you let our streets deteriorate and now you're saying we have to pay for it? So that's a hard one to explain. Speaking of annexation, we have that up here. We've had goals of annexation and I believe, and those are up there, um, we um, are very careful and very strategic about annexation, but the question I get asked a lot is, why do you keep on annexing when you can't take care of the streets we have now? I hear it all the time. And like I said, our annexation plan is very careful and strategic. We know everything about that area because we not only assume their debt and their problems we assume all of their assets 
and we do not put an annexation package in front of the city council unless it's financially beneficial to the city. So before we annex, for example, this year, there was four areas we annexed this year. We knew how many lane miles of road, how many acres of park. We knew the conditions of the street. We knew everything about that area, and it was revenue positive for the city. And that's why we've been able to do the things with that we have done, like expanding our police and fire departments and putting more into the roads because we are expanding and broadening our tax base. That's how you grow. You broaden your tax base, you can lower people's taxes, but you still continue to get more revenue in because we collect in their property tax, their sales tax, their occupation taxes, and in our calculations to, to determine if it's revenue positive, we consider the cost of all the city services. Fire department, police department, maintaining roads, trash pickup, snow removal, we consider all that before we annex an area. This year, the annexation package that the city council just approved had 14 lane miles of road in it. And they were all improved streets. So there's not much more maintenance that we would have to do or rebuilding roads in those areas. So how do we fix this? That's the big question. With the current revenue streams, as I explained, of what we get from federal dollars, what we get from the state gas tax, and what we get locally with the wheel tax, we cannot catch up. Um, additional revenue would allow us for a long-term road maintenance and rehabilitation plan. And again, if we were, if we were resurfacing the, the 250 lane miles every year instead of 125, then every street in Omaha would be touched at least once every 20 years. Let me explain another thing that I think is quite interesting because people will ask me, why don't you use concrete everywhere? And I think that explains it, that at a one lane mile of asphalt is about $155,000. One lane mile of concrete is $1.5 million. Concrete was 10 times more expensive than asphalt, but of course it will last probably 10 times as long. But it's, it's dependent on the amount of money you have in your hand right now. So how do we close the gap? And again, this is nothing that I am saying I'm promoting. I've never promoted a tax increase, but I want to throw these out for discussion and I want to hear what you think about it. Um, one thing we could do is we could try to pass a bond issue. And the reason I like that is because you decide. A bond issue goes to the vote of the people. If you vote yes, it happens. If you vote no, it doesn't happen. Um, and we've tried to figure out three different types of bond issues, and these would be over a five year. But I'll take you down to the end. A $200 million bond issue, if we would put that on the ballot and you would approve it, um, that would generate $40 million additional dollars annually that could go towards rehabilitation projects that would close that gap and still have a little more left over. Remember, it's a $34 million gap. If you live in a $100,000 home, that would mean you would pay about $35 annually in increased taxes to pay the bond debt. So $35 a year, we could, with a $200 million bond, we could do what I'm talking about. Smaller bonds, like a $150 million bond, you would pay about $26 more annually, but it doesn't quite reach that gap. It'll generate about $30 million. $75 million bond issue, it'll generate $15 million more a year, and you would pay about $13 more a year. And it would be sustainable. So people asked me at the last town hall meeting, so it's a five-year bond authorization. So at the end of five years, would we have to do another bond issue to keep it going? Yes, you would. But you would get to vote for it and approve it. Would you have to then pay another $35 on top of that $35? Our finance department has calculated that no, you would not. It would be sustainable. It would be the one increase and you could pass another bond issue and you would not have to pay more. And, and an explanation of that is all of our general obligation bonds, like I told you before, uh, public safety, street, sewer, parks, public facilities, we, we basically recalculate every year what we need to be paying. They all go into kind of one pot and we continuously retire bonds, and we refinance bonds, and then we kind of have a model that we look out and what our valuations will be, what the interest rates will be, and that's how we figure out what we're gonna put in our CIP. With all what's going on with those other bonds, 
we feel like that once we get this first additional $35 annually, you could pass a bond issue after bond issue every five years and your payment to pay the debt would not increase. Let me give you another example to make it clear. Um, this would be a five-year authorization and then we'd have to go out for another bond issue. But in eight years, CenturyLink will be paid off. There's an enormous amount of money we pay bond dollars every single year to pay off CenturyLink. In eight years, it's gonna be paid off. So then we have a ton more bonding capacity. So that's how the, this can go on and on and on without having to raise what you pay more. Um, another option that I wanted to bring up I, I, is wheel tax increase. And I, I love talking about the wheel tax because people tell me all the time that wheel tax was meant to be temporary. When are you gonna get rid of the wheel tax? Well, the wheel tax on an average car is about $50 a year, but it was never meant to be temporary. And we can prove that. The first wheel tax was imposed in 1917. That's over 100 years ago. I have many people say, I remember when that wheel tax was imposed and it was supposed to be temporary. Well, you are over 100 years old if you remember that because it was 1917, it was a dollar. Um, as the years went on, different mayors and city council have increased it to what it is today, average $50 basic wheel tax for a car. We bring in about $23 million a year in the wheel tax, and every penny of it has to go to road and road-related expenses. It all has to go to the roads, and it all does go to the roads. If we, and I've got two bullet points at the bottom. I gave an example. If we were to increase our wheel tax to what Lincoln's wheel tax is, Lincoln's is 74 for a car a year. That would increase what we bring in to 34.9 million, meaning it would bring $11 million more a year. That's not anywhere near close to filling that gap of 34. To fill the gap of 34, it would require a 143% increase in your wheel tax every year, or in front, it would go from 50 to 122. I don't think people would like that, and you don't get to vote for that. That's up to a city council vote. And I would rather this be a, a decision of the, of the people. Another thing that even is more complicated, because Lincoln just did this, they just passed a, a quarter penny of their um, sales tax increase to go to roads. And it makes it much more complicated for the city of Omaha. Um, because the city of Omaha is the only city in the state of Nebraska that's a city of the metropolitan class. And state law says that our local option sales tax is capped at what it is now. And so you pay on sales tax 7% total. And so you pay 5.5% to the state and 1.5% to the city of Omaha. We can't go any more than that the one and a half percent. So if we were to want to increase sales tax, we would first have to go to the legislature and get them to change state law. And then we would bring it back to Omaha and we would put it to a vote of the people. But there's another complication with this, and that is, you remember that restaurant tax that was passed in 2010? The restaurant tax ordinance, it's online, you could look at it. First of all, it doesn't say anything about fire and police pension. It just says it's an occupation tax to bring more money into the city. But the very last sentence says, this restaurant tax will sunset if there is an increase in sales tax. So the restaurant tax is bringing in about $34 million a year. So if we got a sales tax increase, the, the restaurant tax would go away and there would be a $34 million hole in the budget that we probably have to fill with the sales tax. So in the end, it doesn't give you a lot more money. And it was a very complicated ordeal to do. So I think in the sales tax, and again, I'm not promoting a tax increase, but I just want you to understand what the options are. Another thing that could bring us in some more money is an occupation tax that was passed by the city council in 2013. And they called it the tobacco tax, remember that? And that was supposed to be, that was an agreement, a 10-year agreement with Nebraska Medical Center to build their new cancer center. And the city of Omaha agreed to put three and a half million dollars a year that they get the revenue from the tobacco tax to the med center for 10 years. So that's 35 million for the cancer center. Um, that will sunset in 2023. And so it does say in that ordinance, it will sunset in 2023. 
we could take the sunset out, and when it sunsets, we could take that money and put it in the streets. But again, that's going to bring in about $3.9 million a year. It's, it's a lot of money, but it's not going to close that gap. One thing that Councilman Jerem always brings up, too, is that ordinance, as written, excludes the vapes. Um, that's the way it was originally passed. And it is estimated that if they took out the exclusion of vapes, it could probably double the revenue. I'm just going to throw that out, just so you know. Um, another thing that, that we would support, but there's no certainty with this at all because the state legislature would have to do it. They've been talking about this for years, but there are so many sales tax exemptions. There are billions of dollars of sales tax exemptions in the state of Nebraska. And if they would eliminate or reduce some of those exemptions, then there would be billions more money of revenue into the, into the state's budget. Um, some things that they have looked at um, that could significantly in increase our funding that are exempt right now, examples, candy, soda, haircuts, manicures, there's dozens of other things that are sales tax exempt that they've talked about. If they had a sales tax on that, it would bring in a lot more revenue. But that's, a, that's again, that's a long shot, and that would be the state's um, decision. So if we had no action, um, and that's a possibility, maybe I will hear no one wants to do anything, but I really wanted you to understand why we are in the, in the shape we are in. Um, we will continue to prioritize road infrastructure in our annual budget, and uh, we will further refine our strategy for maintenance and rehabilitation, but the same things are gonna happen and the budget increases year after year will be minimal. It's not gonna help us achieve what we want to achieve. Um, improvements will not keep up with the deterioration, with the pace of deterioration. You all saw it last spring, and it was pretty bad. And it will happen again, and we will fall farther and farther behind. And I just don't wanna leave this on future mayors and future city councils to say, we continued on with this Band-Aid approach and um, we're never going to catch up to where we need to be. And every year, the roads get a year older. So that's, that's our real problem. So what is our next steps? We re this is what we're doing right now. We really want to solicit feedback. We want to get um, public feedback. We're going to establish a, web, um, a website um, that uh, we can get feedback. And, and we're, we're going to use our social media. We're going to do some surveys. Um, and, but we want to create a sustainable long-term action plan and we want to do it based on the input that we hear from you and then we need to get to work so I wanted when I mentioned in the very beginning we went to the outside experts I have a list of who we asked to help us come up with these numbers determine these numbers um, of course we always work with our, our public works department and our finance department but we had HDR we had Lampernearson Olson and Benish helped us all um, do this evaluation with our streets and help us determine where we are, what our value is, and what we need to be spending. So they really helped us a lot with, with all of this, the data and gathering this data. And I can guarantee you it's very, very accurate. So that's where we are. And now I would like to open it up. Uh, we can answer, if I can't answer it, I know somebody here, one of our, our team that's here can. I do want to reemphasize though, we are not here tonight to talk about an individual pothole in front of somebody's house or an individual street. We are talking about the broad plan tonight of the entire city of Omaha. Um, and again, one thing I do want to mention is when we talk about, say, the annexation, uh, we bring in a lot of extra revenue when we annex. And again, we don't do it unless we know it's revenue positive. But we annex mostly out west but it brings in money to the general fund and we use that money all over Omaha. And so this summer we have a lot of road projects. Um, like I said, we have 66 million for 2019 in the capital improvement plan. A lot of road projects are going on all over Omaha. Um, and now we get complaints about the road projects because there's cone zones everywhere. But it's very hard when we have a very short construction season in, in Nebraska. We start as soon as the last bit of ice is off the street and we'll go to the end of the year if we can. But it's all dependent on the weather. So we get as much as we can done in a short period of time. So unfortunately, we have to do a lot of work at, the, at, at once and it does cause some congestion. So with that, I'd like to open it up and, and answer your question. And I know there's a well, I'm going to take just a moment just to reiterate what Carrie mentioned earlier. 
So we have the space until 6.30, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Um, so if we could limit your question to one question initially, and that way we can try to get as many people as possible. If we have time at the end, then we, we are able to circle back around and answer some other questions, we will, but otherwise, if we can keep the questions to one initially, we'll try to get as many people as much as possible. So with a raise of hands, we'll start here. Hi, uh, Anderson, and I'm retired from Union Pacific. I was a uh, civil engineer and transportation planner. And uh, I, it was a policy on railroads, I think, generally in private industry, that you don't use borrowed money, bonds in this case, for maintenance. Uh, that's for improvement. So I think it's important to, uh, and certainly a lot of these projects are improvements, mm -hmm. like upgrading an asphalt street to a concrete street. I think that would fall mm -hmm. as an improvement. But, for maintenance, I think we need to look at things like raising the wheel tax. And I just live a block and a half to 72nd, which handles a lot of truck traffic. Mm -hmm. And one thing you didn't mention was uh, how much are the trucks paying for this? They're doing so much of the damage. Mm -hmm. And is there a wheel tax mm -hmm. or any taxes they're paying? Oh, yeah. And you know, I, I, oh, I guess it's you. I, I just know offhand what the average car is. Um, Bob, I don't know if you know, but I know that the trucks pay a higher amount. It's based on the weight and the, and the axles. So, so trucks do that cause a lot more wear and tear on the roads, they do pay more. Yes. And again, the wheel tax, the, the original thought and why, why many cities do it is they figure those who drive on the streets cause the wear and tear on the streets, so you help pay for the streets. And you are very right though, and maybe I didn't do a good job of explaining it, but the bonds, the bond dollars, the street bonds, um, they have to have about a 15 year lifespan. So those are for more of the bigger street projects that we have. But again, go back to what we spent um, in general fund money, 13 and a half million on just potholes this year. And that's, that's where we're wasting our money, but we have no choice. Now people ask me an awful lot, why can't you come up with some other material that lasts longer? Yes. Um, I, why can't you use something different between besides asphalt and concrete? These, these engineers, they, they go to meetings and they have organizations, what the, the um, name some of them, um, uh, Federal Highway. What are some of the other organizations? ASTM standards, American Public Works Association. Right. We're constantly researching and doing research into different types of materials and applications. But the standard in the United States, the standard in most of the world is asphalt and concrete. Um, the state of Nebraska, I met with the director of the, the Nebraska Department of Transportation this morning. He said, they, when you're talking about a, a lot of the, the roads that the state does, they use more asphalt than they use concrete. Now they were very, I hear this too, well you use substandard asphalt or you use substandard concrete, that just is not true. It is not true. They're very specific in what is the, in the mix uh, of those. Bob, come up here and you could explain that better than me because you're the engineer. But um, the, the, how, how we determine what is in the, the materials that we use and how they're tested. Yeah, so we, we have a standard set of specifications that talk about what, what concrete is considered. And so concrete, you use a certain amount of cement. Uh, typically, it's either a six and a half or a higher number of cement. You have a certain amount of water that goes into it. You have a certain amount of aggregate that goes into it. Uh, you, you put air into it, which is a way to, to allow for that freestyle action. And so then we also have testing that goes on. So when, when we do a large concrete pour, uh, we have testing agencies that actually come out and look at a number of things. Uh, does it have, uh, does it meet a certain type of slump test? Does it have the air? What's the water? Uh, they also do cylinders and they do compressive tests to determine what the uh, concrete strength is. So there's a lot of work that goes into not only uh, the quality of the mix that we use, but also the testing of it to make sure that it meets the specifications that, that we have for an individual project. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll, I'll give you another example. I had a, a friend um, who's a physician uh, send me an email the other day and he said he was researching and came along this material that the University of Wisconsin has developed. And he called it a, a supra hydrophobic material that was supposed to be lightweight. Um, it lasts forever. It uh, repelled water. 
I mean, it just, it just sounded ideal, but the questions that I asked him, why aren't you using this, you know, and in the long term it would pay off. But I had to ask him, you know, is this material used now for commercial use? Is it available? Um, well, the answer was no. And what does it cost per cubic yard? Um, I'm not, I don't know. Um, is the material accepted by the American Concrete Institute or the Federal Highway Administration? No. Um, does Wisconsin use it? No. So, I mean, there are people here about products and materials and things, but we are sure open and flexible if somebody is developing something. I mean, we will change if we can, if we need to, if something's available. But right now, about what's available is asphalt and concrete. Keep in mind, there are asphalt streets in Omaha that are 50, 60 years old. And there is concrete that is 100 years old. I mean, it can last that long, depending on the traffic and the drainage and other things. Um, we don't build our streets like the Autobahn that was built for German tanks and an airplane landing strip. So there's a limit of what we can do as far as the depth of our concrete. The interstate is built different in different specs than, than local streets. The interstate is what, 18 inches of concrete? Is that about right? Something like that? You engineers? They're all looking at each other. I'm going to say it's 18 inches on the interstate. What, what is it about in, in the city of Omaha? About nine inches. So, of course, there's different specs. Right, residential seven and, and arterial Okay, arterials nine, residential seven I inches of concrete. Landing strips are about three feet. Yeah, and landing strips are about three feet. So we're not going to build our streets like the Audubon. But, of course, I mean, it's true. If, if, if we built it like that, it would last forever. But it's a, manage of, it's a matter of what we have now with our 5,000 lane miles that we have now. Um, there was an issue that I know I hear a lot about the state several years ago was using some fly ash that caused some problems with some of their concrete that they were using. Um, we don't, I mean there's fly ash in all the concrete I'm assuming, but the type that they were using we don't use. So, so that was a state issue. Caused some peeling and things like that. Other questions? Good evening. Hi. Good evening everyone in America. I got three issues, Mayor. One, I say here, yeah, I listen, I read your little report and all, but I take notice that there's a discrepancy. Everything on the north of Bragg, street rise and everything else, compared to everywhere else. I know it's 98 feet all the way from the beginning, from 6 8 all the way to the end of the center, is being repaid with Siemens. But nothing was wrong with 98 Street, because I ride up and down it every day when I have a job up there. So you have to get the steam in it right now, and nothing was wrong with it. And I know the same thing on the west side, all this things are paved, nice and all, but when I come over here to the north, it's right. The second issue, Your Honor, is the park. You had to build a park down here on 30th Street. Uh, can I answer your park question later? Because I really want to concentrate on roads right now tonight. And streets. Well, let's, we could talk about parks later, but let me answer your first question since it's related to streets, because I don't want, we're not here to talk about our parks tonight. But, but I will agree that there's a lot of work to do in the eastern part of the city, both North Omaha and South Omaha, because they are the older parts of the city and the roads are older there. And a lot of them were built with asphalt and they are deteriorating. Um, the, 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 the prioritization we do every year of what streets we're going to resurface and what streets we are going to reconstruct, a lot of it, I'm going to have Bob come up here again, but a lot of it depends also on the traffic. You know, a, a lot in North Omaha are residential streets. Uh, we, and, and our list just came out, you just gave it to me today, I think, of all of the street resurfacing we are going to do this year. And there are a lot in North Omaha that we are doing. It's basically because it is an older part of the city. Same thing in South Omaha. Do you want to address, I don't know 90th Street, if you want to. Yeah, there's a section of 90th Street that goes from uh, Dodge Street North. Uh, that, that's a state highway, and that's one of the state highways that the state identified as doing improvements on. So that's going to be done as part of the state project. The section from Dodge Street South, there are locations there where we have panels that are failing. So when you have cracks and things like that in the settlement, those are future problems, so we're putting money into those particular sections of roadway. There are locations within, uh, uh, I'm going to look at like um, 24th Street, up and down 24th Street, that we did a significant amount of work here a while back with regard to replacing sewers in the area. I think MED replaced some 
uh, utilities in the area and we actually ended up putting in a lot of concrete streets in those areas. 30th Street right here is, is scheduled to be resurfaced essentially from I think about Cumming Street all the way north to Ames Street. That's scheduled for next year. In fact, that's one of our uh, safety improvement projects that we're getting federal funding on. In addition to the federal funding, the city is going to add money in to, to do resurfacing in that particular section. Any street that we do, we typically look at a number of things. One is, is that what, what kind of rating does it have? What condition is it in? What kind of traffic is associated with it? You know, where, where is it located? Is it a residential? Is it a major street? Those types of things that we look at from the standpoint of prioritizing and then de developing a plan with regard to replacing or actually resurfacing a section of roadway. Now, we did, we did Ames. Uh, we did Ames a number of years ago where we did from essentially the North Freeway West all the way to Fontenelle. Uh, there's been a lot of other activity in that area on Ames Street. MEDs replaced some utilities there. The city's gone in and done some uh, some panel repairs in that particular section. So there's work that goes on all mm -hmm. over the city of Omaha. Mm -hmm. We're just not singling out certain locations. Uh, there's a significant amount of work that goes on in North Omaha, South Omaha, Northwest, and Southwest. Mm -hmm. Another example um, of Maple Street. I mean, you made that 108 to 204. People look at that as a street out west. That's another state project. The state of Nebraska is doing that project from 108 to 204. And that's a two year project. I just pulled out our 2019 uh, City of Omaha resurfacing projects and I just quickly counted about 30 projects up in North Omaha alone um, that will be done this year in 2019. So there's a whole list of them. In fact, um, if you break it up into city council districts, I would estimate that the majority are in District 1 and 2. So, I mean, we, we, we do it as according to where the needs are, where the traffic is. But again, we are restricted every year on the amount of money that we have to spend. So we do not say we're going to spend most of our money out west and not north or south. But, but it is true that the streets are much older. In fact, sewers, I mean, if you talk about sewers in a lot of the eastern parts of the city are 100 years old. I mean, it was built first. Other questions? Yes. Where are you? There you are. <laughs> Good evening, Cheryl Watson. Um, I, you went over a lot and everything. Is this PowerPoint somewhere on your website or where you can take it? Did you know yes. You've given a lot and you expect an answer, but you didn't need to give you your Yes. Yes. So yeah. You, you can contact us. And there, on the page, there's a place where you can click to send questions or email or anything. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to make sure that the PowerPoint was out there for everybody to see and review. And, and the first presentation that I did on Tuesday, it's videotaped and you can watch the whole thing because we're sharing the same information at every meeting. So it's, we want you to be able to, to see it and, and continue to ask questions. Good evening. Hi. Uh, I'm glad that you asked a question about Ninetieth uh, Street because between Ninetieth and Dodge and Pacific, it's been resurfaced two or three times this year and all day. So I'm glad that you asked that question. I just wanted to say. No, wait. Let me let me say though, it hasn't been resurfaced two or three times. If Bob told you there are certain panels that have failed that we have to go back and replace them or we're going to start having problems because water will seep down. So we're doing mostly panel replacements, it's not resurfacing the whole thing. No, I didn't say the whole thing. I didn't say the whole thing. But I've driven past there almost hmm? weekly. And we have to do one lane because they're working on this side. Mm -hmm. That lane because they're working on that side. Mm -hmm. I didn't say the whole thing. Um, I do want to say that. You mentioned your preference would be the boundary issue. And I just wanted to remind you that taxpayers are paying for bond issues for Omaha Public Schools. They're paying bond issues 
for the sewage declaration. Uh, they're going to be paying uh, for the Douglas County Correctional Center. So while it looks like it won't be that much for a homeowner, when you add up all of the bond issues that the city has going, it's going to be a lot. Mm -hmm. The same with the wheel tax. Now, $50 to some people may not look like much. But I work with a group of senior citizens who are complaining about the $50. Mm -hmm. Said anymore? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Because a lot of them are referred to the panic. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about some of the things that you want to do, I would like for you to keep all citizens in mind, not only the property. And, and I appreciate you saying that because that's exactly why we're doing these things. Um, and the, the reason that I said I think the bond issue would, would potentially be the best answer is because you have the ability to approve it or not approve it. You know, all of those bond issues that OPS did, they were voter approved. It went out for a vote and the voters said, yes, I want this to happen. So you could vote for them or you could reject them. I think if, if we do anything that we get more revenue, and, and I explain the problem and really what we need, um, I would like it to be voter approved. And because I realize that, it's kind of that adding on. I explained to you the city of Omaha's part, our 22% of your property tax, but it's that adding on what the other taxing entities have done. So you know, we get it, but as far as the amount that we are getting and that we are, our levy is, it's small compared to say what the schools are. And then the other part, right, you get the wheel tax. Mm -hmm. How are you taxing those individuals who do not live in Omaha who drive our streets because they work in Omaha? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting thing because we used to have a three mile jurisdiction um, that we, just three miles, um, that we could impose the wheel tax. And when I was on the city council, the state of Nebraska took that away. So we right now cannot impose any type of tax on people that live outside the city limits, even if they, uh oh, even if, uh, do I put, do, even if they drive in the city every single day, um, we can't, come and somebody look at this thing. I did something to it. Um, even though they drive on our streets every single day, we cannot impose that. Do you, I, I don't know if you remember too, when I was on the council, there was a short time, this was a, a, an ish, uh, something that Chris Jerem got passed, but it was called the commuter wheel tax, and that's almost what you're talking about, that people that commute into Omaha and commute out, and that was thrown out by the state of Nebraska after it was passed. Can we handle that? No. Well, you're honest, you won't support the wheel tax tax the beer, the wine, the liquor. Y'all got a, a church on every block. So tax the beer, the wine, the liquor then. But that's the state of Nebraska. That's why I said that that's something out of my control. What I want to talk to you all about is, is things that possibly the voters of Omaha could vote on because you're going to be the one, if you decide to do this and it's the right thing to do, you're going to be the one that's paying it. You should be the one to approve it. Um, to take away those exemptions that we have, say on beer or whatever else, that is something that I can't do in the city of Omaha. That's the state of Nebraska. Those are those exemptions that I mentioned earlier. And they have been talking about that for years and years. And they talked about it again this year. And, and nothing has really been done about those sales tax exemptions. Everybody There's a lot of them. And you know what? Most of them, most of the sales tax, well, I, I don't know. I'm, I might be not speaking accurately. But I would say the majority are agriculture related. And so, you know, you got a lot of senators out in the third district in western Nebraska that are looking out for the farmers and to take away their sales tax exemptions. Um, that, that, that would probably be a long shot, but it's nothing that we can do. I just know that every grocery store, every gas station, Sears, mm -hmm. I know, I know what, you are, you are correct. Back right here. Sure. Your Honor, uh, I've been a long life, so my name is Bill Ryan, I've been a life, uh, lifelong resident of this city. When I was eight years old, we had a winter very similar to this. Uh, Johnny Rosenblatt was the mayor. 
Real tax went to six dollars, and the streets were horrible. Mm -hmm. Today it's fifty and seventy-five for a truck. I've heard a lot of information coming your our way. I want to give you some information and the traffic engineers. The box that I have in the corner. It's inside the box that most good engineers think. I obey the rules. I go by the standards. But the standards are now broken. And I'm going to offer three, three solutions. One, we have a more vigorous, rigorous inspections department within the city for the concrete mix or set and the development of streets and sewers and regulations that you do not have five or six <coughs> lanes of traffic before you have a sewer. And the, the last one is crowning, crowning the road. I can break 10,000 pounds of concrete with just this 12 ounce cup of water poured in a crack. But if you have a crown road, you have not only saving money on maintenance, you have a much safer street. You have the water drain off of it, you don't have ice buildup, and the snow and the snow plows can get into the side. Is this construction science? I think it's common sense. And I went to the meeting a year ago on 78th Street, and I was told by one fine young man, oh, I said, what's the crowning uh, measurement for a street? Uh, it's 2%. I said, how about if you go 4%? Oh, no, that's a federal standard. Well, the federal standards work for Texas, they work for Oklahoma, they work for uh, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Alabama, Georgia, uh, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, but we have, we have an extreme. We have 20 below zero and we have 110. And this one cup of water can break up 10,000 pounds of, of concrete because it doesn't roll off of the street or go into a sewer. I'm offering a suggestion mm -hmm. that Mayor Stockard, this become, becomes your crowning achievement. It's going to take decades. In 1959, I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. You do the math, I'm 68 now. And no place in Omaha has a crowning street. Everything's just flat. Just go, just catch it. Crown it, and you'll get twice the age. Th thank, you. thank you for your comments. Now, I'm gonna ask our, I'm gonna ask our street engineer to come this way, Ty Fitzer. And while he's coming, I'm gonna I'm gonna say these engineers, yep, they're pretty black and white. There's no doubt they're engineers, but I find them to be very flexible, very open to new ideas, new technologies. They follow what are best practices throughout the country. I don't find them not being open to doing something that is newer, better, better technology. I think they're always open for that. As far as the crowns, I know we do put crowns on, but I'm going to let Ty talk. He's better at this than I am. We actually don't do crowns. We have drawn in the picture. That's, that's a curve surface. It's very, very difficult. This is exaggerated. You're correct. Okay. Yeah. But we do provide cross slopes. And it's 2 to 4% ends on the road of the drainage. We have a cross slope, so then when it rains or snow, the water flows into the storm drain, goes into the storm drain, and disappears. One of the things that concerns me point out the standards for the southern states, 
you are exactly right. We have extremes here, and that, that is a huge challenge. We also have very poor soils for our roads, which doesn't help us any as well. But the greater crust, though, or the greater crowd, to use your word, that you put in, when you get an ice storm and the roads are slippery, cars will slide off that road and over into the curb if you get too extreme on your cross them. So that's why the standards are for what they are for regions like ourselves that get ice and snow. You can only get to a certain cross slope where you have to balance how well the water drains with the safety of the driving public when it's very slippery. So I'll be happy to, to talk to you afterward and get mm -hmm. some of your ideas. What about um, and the same type of standard? Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, we had the uh, uh, reflective uh, separation along the interstate. Yeah. It looked great. That's great for California, Arizona, New Mexico. And then we get a freeze, we get snow, and you get a 100,000 pound snow plow, pop, pop, pop. Two people were dead in Kansas, and many uh, people were injured across uh, this whole Midwest region when they had the reflectors put in the, in, in the concrete. I'm saying that if you have a dry street and you crowd it at least at four percent, then you don't have the ice buildup, you don't have the water buildup, and you don't have the snow buildup. So if we can limit your comments for one at a time, we've got some other folks here. Well, as well. I want him to answer what uh, uh, you you mentioned. One other thing, I wanted Todd to answer. You you said get better inspections. I wanted him to address that because you brought that up in the beginning. Yeah, I would like to address the inspection. We have standards in the city of Omaha, and we have in-house inspection services, so we have our personal public works engineer that are on jobs. We also hire consultants throughout the city that do the design work and the inspection work for us. We go through ASTM standard testing, we take cylinder examples, samples as the director referred to earlier, they do compression testing, slump testing, temperature, air entrainment, water content, all of those things on every job that the taxpayers do. We meet all state, local, and regional standards when we do that. In fact, we exceed them. If you look at the PSI requirements for the state requirements, we exceed them by 10 to 15% on our concrete. So we do inspect every single project, even sidewalks, that the taxpayer money is paying for. Sidewalks, curbs, sewers, pavement, everything like that is fully tested. And, and we have people all the time they go back, they pull out panels because they fail to test, or they, they re-grind roads, or they do things because they did not meet the standards. And we I, have that. I, I'm referring to Sir, okay. Okay. Um, I, I think, wait, okay, go ahead. Because you had your hand up. Did you want to ask him something? Yes. Okay, uh, let, let, let her ask, and then we'll get to you. Project Pastor? In Miller Park was one of the first sewer separation or second. And it really hasn't been that many years. And my sidewalk has four cracks in it already. I called three years ago because there were potholes in the street. That's a completely new concrete. That shouldn't be. It's never going to last 20 years. No. The quality of, of, of stuff that you're using now won't even last 15 years. You bring up a great point, and in that, we are still using standardized concrete, and as engineers, we have one saying I'll share with you, whether it's funny or not, you can decide. But engineers say there's two kinds of concrete, that that has cracked and that that will crack. Concrete is very, very brittle, and it all cracks eventually, there's cracks in this floor. If you look here in this building, it's a couple of years old, and it doesn't even get rain or snow. So concrete does crack. Your pothole question, I'm as concerned about it as anybody in this room, the joints, we are continuously working with the state concrete standards, the national concrete folks. We, as engineers, have to play by different rules. In 1972, when the Environmental Protection Agency went into play, they would not allow things, they, they forced things to be put into concrete that didn't used to be there because the, the waste from producing that concrete was, in, was polluting the environment. So we're now forced to put things into concrete that we didn't have to 40 or 50 years ago. And the concrete industry is still working to try to improve their concrete. But I agree with you. It doesn't, in some areas, we are not getting the performance out of it that we'd like to see. And we are uh, spending dollars and researching and working with people to try to solve that problem as well. Mm -hmm. Pastor Cabot? Yes, we're right before she got it. Um, Y'all have brought so much to us at this particular time. And with all due respect, Mayor, I'm stop it and staff. You know five o'clock is not a good time to come and to 
you are the home and home when people are working. So I just want you to take into consideration the 5, 6, 30 is not a good time to be in this neighborhood for a residents to come out. And then uh, you want to hear from residents, but on the front end, you didn't respect their time frame. Let, let, let me address that right now. Because when we have our seven town hall meetings every fall, and I have done 42 already, one of the biggest questions we get asked is can you can you vary the times of day that you have them so us that work in the evening us that have kids in the evening uh, that that everybody can find at least one area in omaha that the time will work for them where it's the same information that we're given at all four it doesn't mean that this one is specific for north omaha it means if this doesn't work for you, you could go to the one in South or the one at, at the Community Engagement Center at UNO. We tried to vary the times to see if we could have enough periods of time that every it would work for everybody. Tomorrow I'm doing one at 11 a.m. So, so that's why we did it. And, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I think if somebody in North Omaha couldn't make this one, hopefully they could make the one in the evening or the one in the day. And that's why we did it. It was a request from people just, that wanted to just attend. Just keep in mind, however you take it, I just put it out there. Mm -hmm. But then also when we talk about the mixtures, are we making sure that the mixture is the same no matter who's putting it down? And on Ames, Ames is a major thoroughfare that we still catch in or we fix the clock and then it still gets potholes. So we need to look at the mixture as uh, engineers, you go to conferences, y'all are doing all this brainstorming or, right, or uh, putting mixtures together. You ought to come up with the right answer of what needs to be done on the streets that we have. What, well, you want to address Ames? I mean, well, I, I can't, I won't address Ames specifically other than to tell you that it is the same on any street. It's the same concrete, it's the same asphalt, it's all the same no matter what you're putting it It's from the same suppliers, it's being put down by the same contractors, and it's for the same standard. Mm -hmm. And if it's not right, if we come out and test it and it doesn't meet, they got to tear it back out at their expense and replace it. Somebody complained on 168th Street from Dodge to Maple last year, we did that project, and somebody called in and complained and said, you just built that project last year, you're already tearing concrete out and repairing it. What kind of work is that? Well, that was... Our inspectors went out there and told the contractor, this piece is not meet standards, tear it back out at your expense and put it back in before we will pay you for that project. So that contractor lost the money on that, it didn't cost the taxpayers anything. But there's an example of our inspectors catching a product that wasn't put in correctly to our standards, they had to tear it out and replace it, we didn't pay them another penny for that, they just lost that money. And you know, we, we do, I mean, we, what, his point of we use the same suppliers, we use for asphalt, for example, um, Council Bluffs use it, Papillion uses it, Bellevue uses it, um, La Vista uses it. I mean, we have several suppliers for concrete and for asphalt, and we're all using the same stuff. So it's not that the city of Omaha has somehow chosen some inferior product. It, we're using what everybody else is doing, and we test it. But they take priority on neighborhoods, so I didn't notice that. No, 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 no. They don't use different asphalt or concrete on different neighborhoods. And keep it in and what? Well, this is what we're this is what this is what we're talking about. Yeah, this is what we're talking about tonight. The one? Yes. So I'm curious about when we talk about five thousand lane miles of roads, people using using the roads, lots of cars. Are we talking about reduction of cars off the road entirely? Mm -hmm. Because I think when we're talking about public transport, public transportation infrastructure, alternative transportation infrastructure, scooters, bikes, walkability, all of these other forms to reduce the amount of cars and trucks on the road entirely, um, and maybe even taking a proactive approach on that, a, a rather, uh, you know, aggressive approach because sustain if we're thinking about sustainability of roads and sustainability of the city entirely, everyone one one person per car times year will will result in worse roads and a worse environment. So are we thinking about sustainability in our environment entirely, not just in the roads. Yes, you are absolutely right with that. Um, you know there's multiple things that we are doing to look at 
um, the whole issue of, of transportation and infrastructure. Um, we are, we just this afternoon had our smart city meeting that we're working with a lot of uh, other mayors from, from other parts, from Bellevue and from La Vista and from Papillion. Different mayors are working with it with more of um, um, some initiatives that are all based on technology and transportation that we could pilot here in Omaha. Newer things that we can do, um, um, autonomous vehicles, um, uh, bicycles, uh, dedicated lanes, um, dedicated lanes for scooters if people want to use them, um, public transportation, which we are doing with the BRT. There's multiple things that we are all working on. We have a, um, a, a unified transportation plan that the, the Omaha Chamber and a lot of entities are working on for the whole area, and we're talking about just those things. We have a complete street policy now with the city of Omaha that with every new development, we look at how all people commute, whether it be pedestrians, bicycles, cars, whatever. But the important thing is, is that what is fundamental to all of those are streets in good condition. You are not gonna wanna build a bike lane, a dedicated bike lane uh, on a street full of potholes. So we have to be for, and we are doing all that work and we are studying that and we are, developing plans for all of those things that you mentioned, but we must address this first. This is fundamental to everything else. And we are almost right at the 6.30 mark, so we've got time for two more questions, and then we're gonna have to wrap up. Well, that's a great comment, and uh, I wanna go ahead and say I support the bond. I think a great way to address a lot of those things would be to include them in the bond issue, because um, as you said, solving the roads problem is important, so if we're raising money for roads, Fix and light and the additional infrastructure we need. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. That's one more. And you are a bicycle guy, right? Yeah. yeah I know. That really <laughs> <laughs> I got one more here. Do you want to ask you about that when you get done? No, hold on. Yeah, you, at the, at, after we're done here, thanks. Yes, uh, I didn't see anything mentioned really. You did mention pedestrians just now, but in the uh, problem with the statement uh, the pedestrians were mentioned. Well, last night on Channel 7, the 10 o'clock news had an excellent piece about dangerous intersections uh, to pedestrians. Uh, they happened to be focusing on a lady that was uh, hit at the Western Bay in the 120th. And I went out and looked there, and sure enough, that's another intersection with no crosswalks painted. And all of the downtown right between the street, except at a couple of schools, there's no painted crosswalks. And they're trying to lay the problem on flashing yellow arrow. Mm -hmm. That's a new feature they put in. But without crosswalks, pedestrian voters are reminded that they're crossing a pedestrian path. Mm -hmm. And you know, we rose, raised our kids uh, mm -hmm. to cross an intersection and use the crosswalk. Well, the crosswalks aren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, no wonder they are crossing where they should be. I think, I, I'm going to let you say, so, as you're walking up, I'll, I'll, let me say what I think, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that the painted pedestrian crosswalks give people a false sense of security. I think kids feel like if they're there, I can go ahead and go across and everybody's going to stop, and they don't necessarily do that. Are you agreeing with me about pedestrian painted crosswalks? Yes, I agree with that statement. Okay. The higher the speed, the worse that condition presents itself. Mm -hmm. Another thing with that, that uh, with the flashing, the flashing yellow arrow. I, I honestly, I do not understand why people don't think that that is better, because it replaces the green ball. So if you are making a left and you got a green ball, what does that tell you? Go. And if you got a flashing yellow arrow, what does that tell you? Proceed with caution. I mean, that's, that's what I learned in driver's ed, and I'm pretty old. So I, I don't, I, it's something different. And, but I think that standards show and data shows throughout the country, am I right? That on the flashing, yellow, flashing yellow, arrow. yellow arrow is much, much safer than a green ball. And true, the cars coming in the other direction, they have the, they're, they're moving, but if you have a green arrow and you're making a left, you think you can go. So, I, to me, I'm, I'm perplexed at why people think that that's difficult and it causes accidents because it's really proven it does not. Yeah. 
I think the crosswalk is important. Mm -hmm. I don't agree that it's superfluous or because mm -hmm. it also tells cars where to stop. Right now they pull way into the uh, blocking the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. the pedestrians have to walk around mm -hmm. with vehicles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, What's your thought? I mean, do you have any more addition about yeah, this, the pedestrian crosswalk? We do paint pedestrian crosswalks at many locations. We actually developed a criteria years ago to look at the amount of pedestrians, the amount of traffic, the speeds, and put all that into the formula. The, the issue becomes is there's a cost for putting out pedestrian crosswalks. In this town, as you all know, as we put down salt and sand every day, it's very difficult to keep the paint looking fresh. We would paint most of our streets twice a year. So we prioritize, because there's only so much money to spend, as the mayor indicated earlier. So we prioritize where those crosswalks should be painted. So we paint them in the downtown area where there's a large number of pedestrians. We paint them near schools, crosswalks, playgrounds, things like that. But to paint them at, at every signalized intersection in Omaha is a monumental task. We currently don't have staff and budget to do all of that. So we try to look at where we get the most benefit. So where the drivers see that, they know there's going to be pedestrians present, we keep those painted. And that's how we're doing today. In the interest of everybody's time, I want to say thank you to Mayor Stoutler for coming out. I just have to ask one question. Just, this is totally non-scientific. It's just on, on spur of the moment of what I talked about tonight. I just want to ask for a show of hands of what you have heard tonight. If, 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 if we were to pass a, a, a $200 million bond issue and put it on, on, on the ballot to vote on, who would vote for it and say yes or not? Understanding you would pay about $34 more a year. Who, who would be I would vote?